Welcome all pregnant families, midwives or birth workers. This is Tracy Anderson Askew, your host for the Transform Your Birth podcast, changing your mind about birth one story at a time. Each week we will be exploring a birth story through the lens of what birth can teach us. I'll be digging deep into each story so you can learn what it is that can change the way a birth unfolds. We can't control birth, but we can influence it. So listen in to find out how. Enjoy. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jennifer Summerfeld from Canada. Jennifer holds an MA in Counselling Psychology and is a certified Canadian counsellor. She is the Chief Empathy Officer of Ask Therapy. She's also the creator of the Flowing Fears Process, which is what we're discussing today. With over 20 years of experience within the fields of maternal health, childbirth, psychology studies and the transpersonal, she uses her expertise and voice to help advance the dialogue on trauma-informed care, maternal mental health and healing in general. We're going to speak about her own personal experience of overcoming trauma as the gateway into her current work of helping others transform through trauma using her modality called the Flowing Fears Process. I found our conversation fascinating in that it broke down the places where the nervous system can get stuck in the story. And when we move to the somatic experience, we have a doorway into exploring much deeper patterns that can unlock our own potential. There are links to Jennifer's work in the show notes below. So put on your seatbelts, people. We're going for a ride. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. Most of the stories you will hear through this podcast are graduates of the Transform Your Birth workshop held in Canberra. Our Transform Your Birth Today course is now available to anyone, anywhere, at any time and includes all the wonderful wisdom of this course and live weekly catch-ups when you need it with our host, Tracy. For a little taste, please accept our pregnancy gift offer, which can contains free, the first few lessons and some essential wisdom for pregnancy. The link can be found in these show notes or visit transformyourbirth.com.au. And now for the episode. Well, hello again, my lovely community, those people out there listening to this wonderful Transform Your Birth podcast, where we really look at what moves the needle in birth, what are the things we can do in our preparation that can help us to make that transition much better and much smoother. And a big part of the teachings we've been um, doing for a long time is understanding the role of the mind in birth. It sometimes gets forgotten in the clinical space, and yet any midwife who's worth a salt knows that birth is much more of a mental and emotional journey than it is a physical one. So with me today is the lovely Jennifer Summerfeld from Canada. We're so, so very lucky to have her here today, and she's got a process around fears and what we know about fears is that it can get in the way of women being able to work with birth, not against it. And it's something that's important to explore in your pregnancy. So I want to welcome Jennifer for being with us here today. Thank you, my darling. That's awesome. Mm, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited to be here. My mind's already spinning with so many things that I would love to speak yeah. about. So Beautiful. we'll see where this goes. Yeah. So Jen, tell us a little bit about how you got into this field and, and what's your drivers behind the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, well, I like to go all the way back and begin actually pre-pregnancy. Um, so my oldest son is 24 and I had no idea that I would be in this world, this, mm. this culture of birth. Um, so prior to pregnancy, I was actually studying performance psychology. I was in graduate studies. Um, so I was very much focused on um, peak performance, athletics, working, you know, it's pretty male dominant culture, um, the culture of athletics and sort of that drive to, you know, strive towards being the best version of yourself as you can. But a lot of it is about mindset, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, so preparing your mind, preparing your body um, so that you can show up on quote game day mm -hmm. and just be in the flow. So I share that because um, when I discovered that I was pregnant with my first, you know, that's always a transitional point for so many of us, especially those of us who um, enter this culture of birth, right? End up doing work within this 
arena. And many of us are initiated after that first birth experience. Yeah. So that, true. you know, similar story. Um, mm -hmm. I had, I, I, I did not ever plan to be a mother. Um, my family likes to tell me that I would declare to everybody that I'm I'm not going to have children. So it was a surprise. My mother told me the same thing, actually, <laughs> which made me shook, shake my head because I ended up with four, but I had the same thing when I was growing up. I'm not having yeah. children. Yeah, yeah, I have three. three. <laughs> Whoops. Um, and so, yeah, so I was surprised to mm -hmm. be pregnant. I was young. I was 23 years old. It was unplanned. Um, but I just kind of immediately responded to that as this is the next game in life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really focused in on learning as much as I could learn at that young age. This is before the internet, um, you know, before the mass internet, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I gathered my information by having face to face conversations with people, by reading books that were recommended to me. And, like most people, you know, I thought I wanted to join the club of um, what to expect when you're expecting. And, you know, that book was the first book that I picked up. And, you know, for those of for those out there who may have heard me on other podcasts, I kind of tell this story, but I have to remember that a lot of people haven't. So yeah. it's a good story. And, um, you know, so I read that book. And since we're talking about fears, I noticed that that book initiated so much fear. Mm. And it opened my eyes to this world of birth that I felt like was behind this veil that I had no idea about because I wasn't raised in, you know, having conversations about childbirth or even motherhood, right? Um, yeah, it was yeah. just, it's that thing that's kept from us until we discover that we're pregnant. And now all of a sudden this world opens up to us. And that's what happened. And so as I was reading that book, I knew in my body that something was off and I didn't like what I was reading, but I had no history or background to like support that, yeah. but something opened up in me and it was a curiosity and maybe it was a curiosity because I was young and I'm grateful for that. So I went on a discovery journey and I don't know, I must've just been very fortunate, but somehow I went from reading what to expect when you're expecting to the next book that was referred to me was Spiritual Midwifery by Ina yeah. May Gaskin. Ina May, yes. I, I right? was initiated into that book, having my first child, and that totally yeah. shifted my perspective. Yeah, right. And so here's two very distinctly yeah. different paradigms of birth. And, you know, they were both at that time, um, you know, one was what you would consider mainstream and the other one is what you would have considered kind of like the granola hippie version of birthing. Mm. And um, I, I wasn't raised within that culture. And like I said, I yeah. came out of this world of athletics and academics. And so um, it was foreign to me. Even the language was foreign to me. It was actually quite mm. uncomfortable when I was reading spiritual midwifery because there was so much languaging around you know orgasmic and you know being comfortable with mm -hmm. um you know all of our intimate parts and at that time I was like what is going on <laughs> you know it wow. sounded like an orgy <laughs> and so <laughs> some um, of her births do sound like orgies nipple stimulation and passion yeah. yeah and like passionately getting them you know so yeah. it it was out of my um comfort zone at that time but you know mm -hmm birth is supposed to stretch our comfort zones, yeah. right? And so well, it's stretching everything else, Jen, it might as well stretch your comfort zone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry to be looking away. I have a, a cat that's trying to come in. And we're just going to make sure that Ooh, she knows yeah, we're talking secret women's out. business, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, exactly. So yeah, it stretches everything else. So it might as well stretch your mind and your comfort zone. Yeah. So I was starting that process of initiation and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm just going to weave in that, you know, I do carry now the worldview that, you know, childbirth is an initiation process. Yeah. It is an ordeal and it's supposed to be hard mm -hmm. and um, hard in a good way. And we can talk more about that. So um, I was going through this journey and I knew instinctively again that 
when I read that book, that book, although it was uncomfortable, there was some truth in it that I wanted to pay attention to. And luckily at that time, I was already interested in natural foods. So I was, you know, shopping at organic stores. So I was starting to get a little bit into the granola culture. And so that's where I came across these alternative ways in which we could give birth mm-hmm. um, was in that store, right? And they had a little book section. And then I learned about doulas and I learned about midwives. And I was like, wow, there's this whole world I didn't know anything about, mm-hmm. which again, I understand to be still very true for a lot of um, people who are yeah. having their first birth experience, right? So um, this part of the story I love, I was I, I hired a hire. I, I say hired. I hired a, a group of obstetricians, and they were female obstetricians, which I thought would be a better option. Mm-hmm. And then throughout my prenatal care, they were hounding me about being a vegetarian. I was a vegetarian back then, and all the herbal supplements I was taking and things like that. So they were quite aggressive with me about the lifestyle choices I was making, and I didn't like that. Wow. And so I would push back in my 23 year old way. And, you know, I felt very confident that I was extremely healthy and that my baby yeah. was very healthy. So again, I was intuitively following my instincts and my body's wisdom without having the language for it at that time. So at about seven months pregnant, I fired my obstetricians and I hired midwives. I interviewed midwives. And back then midwifery um, was still out of pocket. So the the healthcare system didn't fund midwifery back then. So I was a young mom and we didn't have a lot of money. And so, you know, coming up with $2,000 seemed like a really challenging thing to do. And so I sold my motorcycle for $1,500 and that paid for our care and my um the father of my child at that time he won a 50 50 draw and so we came came up with the money and it was the best investment of my life and I say that because I knew that I was in the right environment and I was going to get the right kind of support for that birth and that I was following my inner knowing and that birth experience initiated me. I mean, it still brings tears to my eyes. My son just turned 24. I tell my kids birth stories at all of their birthdays and it still feels so real. And, you know, I, I, I was fortunate in, in that um, I, because of my athletic background, I, I knew how to prepare my mind and my body to give birth as if I was peak performing in an athletic event. Yeah. And so that is how I treated it. And, you know, I faced all the challenges that we all face. And somehow I found my way and I just surrendered to the intensity of that birth experience and had a spontaneous home birth in water after four and a half hours of labor. Mm. So I didn't understand at the time that that is pretty unusual within Mm -hmm. the culture of birth. Mm -hmm. And so you could imagine with all my hormones intact, I was high as a kite (laughs) afterwards. Yeah, Yeah. which is mother nature's intention. She wants us to be ready for that next big period. And you don't get a lot of sleep and there's a lot of change taking place. And if we can come through optimizing the body's physiological response to the birth in that setting us up for birth on the other side. I talk about this in another episode Mm. worth looking at how birth sets us up for parenting. So you're describing an an example of that. So Mm. that would have awakened a few senses in you, Jennifer. To my surprise, you know, I had, you know, something else that's so curious is being such an athletic person. I also very much identified back then with the more tomboy kind of labels. I know we don't use those labels now, you know, very masculine, um, had no connection to my feminine side. And so it was shocking 
right. for me to now be flooded with, you know, the cocktail of our hormones, like the hormonal blueprint that Michelle O'Don talks about, yeah. or Buckley, Sarah Buckley from Australia Sarah talks Buckley. about. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I experienced that and, and it overwhelmed and overtook my system you could put it that way right and it just instructed me how to be a mom and so i became very committed to motherhood and i also became very committed to um spreading this knowledge to as many people as i could i even wrote that birth story it went in a journal you know back in the day 24 years ago and i was quite proud of that accomplishment you know it felt like i had won the olympics and and then there's more birth stories obviously i could tell because they're all distinct yeah. and one of them i wrote about actually in the book healing after birth but that being said you asked the question what initiated me what got me into it so obviously that initiated me then i went on to open um a store that served parents and you know we wanted to be a community hub and we wanted to serve as many local families as we could and So we opened a store called Earth Mother, a good mother friend of mine. We're still friends to today. um, today. And then from there, we studied to be a holistic doula. And then I went in to study um, traditional midwifery, so direct entry midwifery, and spent a lot of years just in the world of birth, in the world of instinctive physiological birth. And all of that was motivated from the place of what can we be doing to support moms to be able to have the best possible birth experience so that Mm -hmm. they could experience this kind of ecstasy and this attachment that is so instinctive to our nature and how can we mitigate and prevent them from experiencing some of the harms Mm -hmm. that can happen within the hospital Mm -hmm. system and what can we be doing to reduce the fear Mm -hmm. and increase the trust in birth so that was all underneath you know, my, the motivating factors underneath everything that I was doing. Yeah. And then fast forward later on, um, you know, there, there was a significant event in my life that removed me from attending births and that initiated me on my own healing journey. And that's when I got deeply curious about trauma-informed care. How do we heal from trauma the neurobiology of trauma. And then as I went through my own healing journey, realizing that this also reflects birth trauma and how do we heal from birth trauma and what is happening here in the postpartum Mm. for moms, how much of that is kind of a result or a symptom of having had a traumatic or disappointing or interventive birth experience. Yeah, yeah. And so that is sort of how I got full circle. So in my late thirties, I went back to school to complete my master's and focus in on trauma informed care mm. and specifically perinatal mental health. Yeah. Wow. What a mm-hmm. journey. That's a really short version. Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I love a good story always, but yeah. how women, um, how our experience can set us up on a path. And I often think birth workers are often called to this field because there's this huge um, revelation of what a significant period of time this is. And, you know, I love the term you know rite of passage but I love even your term of initiation Mm -hmm. is that understanding that it is traditionally and always has been one of these parts of secret women's business in bringing women into readiness to using modern language upgrade the system to be ready to parent because Mm -hmm. the mother is a bigger version of the woman she has much more to hold in her whole Mm -hmm. system and her whole being so of course mother nature is going to wake us up and it is going to be hard and tough and and sometimes we have complexity and sometimes women need help so every woman's got to walk her own path with that yeah now you've put together this beautiful process around um the mm-hmm. flowing fears process um mm-hmm. it's an embodied 10 step process to support 
transformation and change. I'd love for you to to mm -hmm. share us um, with us, Jen, a little bit about how that came into being, and then and talk more about what it is. Sure. So um, I would love to, and I'm my brain is trying to figure out how much backstory I need to provide yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to drop right into the process okay. itself. But let's just say that the process was an accumulation of both lived experience and educated experience mm -hmm. in which I was amalgamating um, different trauma-informed modalities and approaches as well as transpersonal and some shamanic work in, in looking at all the ways in which we heal. Yeah. And specifically, you know, there was a moment in time where I had been on my healing journey for a few years. And, um, and that journey looked like healing from PTSD and going to a psychologist three times a week and doing extensive EMDR to get my brain back online. So it was a significant investment in my mental health. And I had reached a point in my work with um, my psychologist where I said, it feels like my system is back in conversation and communication with itself. It's no longer as dysregulated as it was. Like, I feel like I have my brain back, but I knew that there was an aspect that had not been healed yet. Mm -hmm. And I would name that as the soul like as the deep healing aspect that we all need. And so I, I speak about the fact that we heal in four different areas. We heal our physical body, our nervous system, our embodied system. Mm. We heal our heart system, our emotional system by metabolizing and digesting these emotions that are usually met, you know, the emotions we experience when we've gone through hardships and traumas. We experience, and then we heal cognitively. We heal the stressful thoughts and the story that we're telling ourselves about that situation. But then we also hear, heal spiritually mm -hmm. and soulfully to mend ourselves, to go from being wounded to wise. Mm -hmm. And so in that process, I knew I hadn't completed my healing journey. And I think we're always on a healing journey and I continue to heal, right? So there's never really an arriving, but there are moments in time that we can mark as transitional in our journey. And um, and so it had been a few years and I was feeling pretty good about the state I was in. And I was at an event and I was actually teaching to a bunch of birth workers um, and birth professionals about uh, trauma-informed care, about how um, we can miss birth trauma, how like I was just teaching them about the neurobiology of it all. Yeah. And somebody had asked a question and that question at the end of the day activated me. And I went into what I call a trauma spiral and I came home and, you know, it felt like all the work I had been doing just got undone. And I spiraled in this internal state in which it felt like I was trapped in a tornado. And I have this vivid memory of being in the kitchen and to this day, that kitchen still seems very dark. It's gray. I'm alone. My husband kind of entered the room and he was standing there in the corner, but there was like no sound. It was just this very eerie kind of um, environment that I was in. And I was like bracing myself on the kitchen table. And I was just noticing the intensity of the, the trigger and the activation that was happening in my embodied system. And part of me was deeply frustrated by this because for those who have done a lot of trauma healing work, mm. when you get reactivated and you think you have gone so far, and then all of a sudden you feel yourself being pulled right back down under, it can feel really discouraging. Mm -hmm. And so part of me was just devastated by this. And of course, I could start to hear things like, I'm a fraud, I'm an imposter, like, how dare I be talking about healing from trauma, and here I am, like, totally dysregulated. And um, this was the birth of the flowing fears process. So what happened was in that moment, I braced myself, I just 
turned my attention inwards. I closed my eyes. I was breathing very heavy. And I heard this voice and it said, you know what you need to do, Jennifer. You know enough. Now you need to go do it. And that was a turning point because, you know, having now worked with hundreds of, of trauma, I want to say survivors, but I don't know if I like that word, but, you know, people who have endured all kinds of traumatic experiences right there, there is this moment where we're tested to apply the knowledge that we've learned and actually shift our own state of being. And it's a hard thing to do when you're completely hijacked by your nervous system and by a trauma trigger. And so in that moment, I heard that voice and I consciously decided to do something different because what would have typically happened and what happens for so many of us is that we get hijacked and we just let that energy take us for a ride. I describe it like we're on a wild horse and the horse is running the show and we're just flying all over the place, hanging on to the mane, hoping that we survive. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the feeling when your nervous system hijacks you. Yep. We also know that neurobiologically, when we're in that state our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that actually is responsible for self-reflection and is responsible to actually regulate the nervous system goes offline, Mm -hmm. right? So I knew all of this and I could hear some of the teachers in the background, like Dan Siegel and, you know, um, Mm -hmm. Peter Levine and stuff like that. I could hear their, their commentary in the background. And, you know, one of the one of the teachings of, of Dan Siegel's work is that we need to be able to hook that prefrontal cortex. We need to be able to bring it back, Mm -hmm. right? If we're in that trigger and the prefrontal cortex goes offline, we need to hook it back online. And the way we do that is by asking a question. So I could hear this. So, Mm -hmm. and so, um, so there I was bracing myself, hearing this, this kind of like voice going, okay, I'm going to do something different. Oh, and where I was going with that is because what my system wanted to do is take the neuronal pathway that it knew, yeah. right? The super highway, yeah, which yeah. was to bring me right down into the dungeon in the basement with all of the terrible critical thoughts and all of the very despairing and at times suicidal ideations like I lived in that place and I knew that's where I was going and I was already hearing it and so it was a choice point Mm. and that choice point changed the trajectory Mm. and you know it was a pattern interrupt and Mm. and you know what that can also be said about birth. There are choice points Mm. that can interrupt that process, right? That can change that outcome, but we can come back to that. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I had the choice point. I had enough knowledge. I knew it was time to do something different. And so in that moment, I heard it. Okay, what do I do next? And then it was like, tune into your body, find your breath. Okay locating it notice the activation okay feeling the sensation so this is very somatic right you can hear how this would be yeah you know something in any kind of somatic trauma therapy so i'm I'm in my body i'm in i'm in the sensation what that did is it took me out of the story yeah right I couldn't be in both places. The minute we're back in the body, we are out of the story. Mm. Birth is an embodied experience. If we're in story about our birth, about our labor, we're not in our body. Yeah. Right. So this brought me back into my body. I'm with the sensation. I'm naming the sensations. And then it is naming the stressful or not the stressful naming the survival emotion. So what I know is that one of my teachers has taught that there are actually only four emotions. Now this is 
contradictive to some of the other languaging that's out there about feelings and emotions. So we can believe whatever we want. Mm. But I like this bioemotive paradigm, which is that we have four emotions and the rest are feeling beliefs. Mm. So the four emotions are fear, anger, sadness. Those are our survival emotions. And then I say we have a thriving emotion. He calls it happiness. I call it joy. Each of those emotions can actually be linked to our polyvagal pathway. So if we link it to our nervous system, we can see the chemical composition that would be associated with those emotions. So we've got our survival emotions of fear, anger, sadness, and then we have our thriving emotion of joy. And then of course we have the spectrum. So yes, we've, you know, we can name all these spectrums. So let's just not get into the semantics, but for simplicity's sake, right? Mm. It's really easy yeah. to, to ask yourself, is it fear or is it anger? Because when you're in an activated trauma state, you are in high sympathetic, right? Mm. You are flooded with sympathetic energy. So you know it's either fear or anger. Mm. And so I just asked, is this fear or is this anger? And it was fear. And so then I just heard the question, what are you hearing yourself say about the situation? So I started to brain dump all the stressful thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that is question one. And then I picked out the most stressful question of all those questions. So now I'm bringing in some of Byron Katie in the work yes. for those of you out there who know her work, right? So mm. I'm layering this in and it's, you know, holding that question and then locating the most stressful, stressful thought and then flowing the fear. And what about, so if that's true, what about that am I most afraid of? And if that happened, what about that am I most afraid of? And if that happened, what about that am I most afraid of? And I went way down to the basement and I call that getting to the, getting to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so it distilled it all the way down to our four core fears, which is as far as your ego mind can go before you enter the transpersonal. Mm -hmm. And so those four core fears are linked to um, Eastern philosophy or Buddhist philosophy, and it's the fear of annihilation or death, the fear of humiliation, the fear of being evil or being bad, and the fear of going crazy or going mad. Mm. Those are considered to be the four core fears of the ego mind. And as a, as a parts worker, you know, inner parts kind of thing, yeah. all of those inner parts really create the ego structure that we talk about, but it's just helpful to bring that language here to make sense of it. So when we get to the basement, in all cases, we land on one of those four fears. Mm. And, you know, in this situation for me, it was the fear of humiliation which results, by the way, in being kicked out of the tribe, right? Yeah. And if we're abandoned or we don't belong, right, it's that's going to, it is, it's going to activate our survival circuits, which are either, right, to connect and to survive. So if we're disconnected, it feels like death mm -hmm. to our system. Yeah. And it could result in death to our system. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense, right? It's all about the you know, mm -hmm. dying right? So you just face that fear head on. And in that, I just kept going, kept going, kept going until the fear lost its grip. Mm -hmm. It lost its holding. And then I landed on, what does that mean about me as a person? So if this happened, what does that mean about me as a person? And I landed on my core limiting belief. Mm -hmm. And for me, I have two primary core limiting beliefs. We, What I've noticed is that we have one or two and they just keep showing up and they were embedded in, in printed in our primary environment, mm -hmm. you know, as far back as even in utero, as far back as even our ancestrals, right? Yeah. Lineage. Mm -hmm. So these core, these core limiting beliefs kind of surface and then that's how we govern our life. Mm -hmm. So mine is I am bad. And so it was all there. And then I was able to work with my inner part 
I could just see where this was coming from. I asked myself, you know, so how far back can I go with this? And then landed on an inner part. And I did inner parts work, like healing work or soul retrieval work, whatever language you want to call it. And so this is a bit of EMDR coming in, you know, so I'm layering this. And so these are all step processes. And then I land there and then I do this release work where I just spontaneously have a compassionate, loving response to that inner part. And I'm holding her, right? And then I ask the question, you know, well, what would you like her to believe about herself in that situation? And every time spontaneous, compassionate, loving, supportive <laughs> language comes through because this is inner work, right? And our system is intelligent and our system wants us to thrive and our system wants us to be open and expansive and, and in the frequency of love. So that's how you know it's true. And so there I was holding all of that. And then I just spontaneously brought myself back to the current situation and held the question, what would you like to believe about yourself now as it connects to that current situation? And from there, there was another spontaneous belief that arose, but it was supportive, mm. right? It was not limiting. It was supportive. And then how would you feel living your life from that place, knowing that that's true? Now, this is a bit of Joe Dispenza's work that comes in here. <clears throat> as, a, as a huge fan of his work for over 10 years, mm. I knew how important it is for us to tap into the possibility of this new potential. Yeah. And that a lot of the therapy work that I've been trained in and the work that I have been doing is a lot of deep dive down and under, digging up, moving emotional material, but just kind of hashing out, swimming around in the same waters and not necessarily, you know, putting a target for that new possibility, that the being that I want to become. And so bringing that piece in really helped to redirect that energy and attention and then hold the vision of it using visualization or creating a mind movie of that potential happening. Mm. So within 30 minutes, I went from this down and under to this up and out state, and then I wrote it all out right? just so that I could keep track of what did I just do? Mm. And so that's been now over I think I've I think uh, over seven years I'm trying to remember uh, may, maybe 2015 I think is about yeah. when that happened might have been 2014 actually so about 10 years ago yeah. and I have been just working with that process over and over and over again and bringing my clients through that process with the same kind of success every time that there's this down and under and this up and out so um it's an effective way for us to work with our fears <laughs> is what I'm saying. Wow. Mm -hmm. With what you've described there, and I love, you know, the story behind the process itself. This is often where great inspiration, great intelligence can come through us to us mm -hmm. because we're living through certain things, you know, mm -hmm. experience is such a great teacher for women who are pregnant who mm -hmm. are aware that they have certain limiting beliefs, potentially traumas, um, mm -hmm. what what sort of things that they can do to help them start to unpack anything mm. that could get in the way of them being able to give birth? Mm. Yeah. There's... Rather large question, isn't it? It is. Yes, it is, um, because it depends on many factors, but... Um, let's just like, let's start with something that's tangible and applicable and anybody could do right now, which is write out all your stressful thoughts, mm. right? Become aware of the story that you're telling yourself about birth, about postpartum, about labor, about delivery. Just start to become aware of those thoughts that are actually governing how you are experiencing or preparing for mm -hmm. right that labor and delivery yeah so we want to be aware of mm -hmm. we want to notice and name mm -hmm. if we don't have that awareness there's nothing we can do 
about exactly. it, right? Because it's driving the car without you even realizing that it's right. in the driver's seat. So that first step is mm -hmm. the first step of separation between your thoughts and your mm -hmm. observer self, where you're actually able to mm -hmm. see what can be the patterns of thought, because thoughts are patterns and they originate, yeah. well, they originate often from a long time ago. Right. And <clears throat> they really create our future. Right. So the process of writing down the things you're worried about, the things you're scared of, what are the things that are yeah. of floating around in there? And then what? Well, and I just want to add to that. So there's a difference between analyzing your thoughts and observing your thoughts. Mm. And oftentimes when we hear write down your stressful thoughts, we start to think about our stressful thoughts. Right. And in the process of thinking, we're actually not observing. Mm -hmm. It takes effort, right? The way I describe it is if we're thinking, we kind of feel like our energy goes up here and we're just like in our mind and we're closing our eyes and we're like searching around, we're searching around, right? And we're, we're doing this act of thinking. And it usually takes cognitive power to do that. Mm -hmm. So what I noticed is, Asking the question, what am I hearing myself say about labor? What am I hearing myself say about delivery mm -hmm. is a very different way of holding a question. And then just pay attention to what you hear. So shifting from what am I thinking about to what am I hearing is a subtle shift in attention and language that can open that door, especially for those who've um, not had the opportunity to become aware of their stressful thoughts. Yeah. So asking that question, writing it down, and then brain dump it. So what I'll have my clients do is just speak it out loud and I'll write it all down for them. What I'll notice is some clients will speak it out loud, but then they will interpret what they're hearing themselves say. And then interpretation sounds more like a conversation, right? When we're interpreting something, there's like language in it that's a little bit more complicated. There's story to it. There's explanation to it. That's interpreting. That's analyzing. That's trying to make sense out of what you were hearing. So what we're interested in is the raw data, not the interpreted data. Right. Right. I'm afraid I won't be able to handle the pain. How is this baby going to come out of my body? How is that humanly possible? Right. Like stuff like that. Yeah. So usually what we hear are very short sentences, very direct. There's not enough, there's not a lot of filler in it. Yeah. Right. It's almost as if it's like a five year old or a seven year old talking. You're not going to get the more highly evolved, intelligent cognitive processor at play here. Right. So paying attention to that. So that I think is really important. Step one. Mm -hmm. Right. Step two is starting to question the stressful thought. So again, I talked about Byron Katie. For those of you who don't know who Byron Katie is, thework.com. Um, I'm not being paid to endorse her, <laughs> um, but great resource, right? It's yeah. a great resource that is free to the public. You know, you can get so much free content on that website and it's a, it's a process to question your stressful thoughts. So her whole thing is when we believe our stressful thoughts, we suffer. Mm. And so the same is true about, you know, those of us who are preparing for labor and delivery or the, even the postpartum, right? When we believe those stressful thoughts, we're going to suffer more. We're going to constrict more. We're going to resist more, right? We're going to feel more anxiety um, or we might um, shut down more. Or we might distance ourselves more. So, so learn how to question those stressful thoughts mm -hmm. and learn how to gather evidence Right. So, yes, um, kind of jumping all over the place, but what's coming up right now for me is a bit of bit of wanting to interject with nervous system understanding. 
what we know is that foundationally there are three contributing factors that support the well-being of our nervous system mm -hmm. and one of them is context so context is information the more information we have the more settled our nervous system will be mm. right so fear is a response to anticipating a threat whether the threat is actual meaning it's happening right now in real time or whether the mind has interpreted the potentiality for a threat your nervous system is going to have an embodied response and move towards sympathetic state, right? It's going to alarm your nervous system. Yeah. So in that alarm state, right? Now, all of a sudden we're scanning, we're looking outside of ourselves for evidence to either ascertain that there is a threat or find a way to actually um, mitigate that, right? Like calm the system down, be like, nope, there is no threat. So when we're worried about something that's gonna happen in the future, right? We're projecting into the future, our nervous system is going into alarm. So if we can gather information and that information helps to make helps us make sense out of it can help to actually dial that down a bit, right? It's going to help to calm down that alarm state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So information, and I know you do a lot of information offering, right? Through your programs and stuff. So that's actually really important mm -hmm. aspect of prenatal preparation, mm -hmm. because the more informed we are, not only the more calm will our nervous system become, yeah. it will also support choice. Mm -hmm. And the other factor, I said there's three, the other factor is choice. Yeah, right. So but coming back before you go into choice, mm -hmm. it's yeah. just you told the story at the beginning of this episode about reading what to expect and then spiritual right. delivery. Right. And it, I, I see this happen a lot when we are getting new information, which can help allay fears, take the power out of those fears. I see it happen all the time when I watch people do my program. Mm. When we give people too much information, which is mm. what's in what to expect when you're expecting, it's, it's mm. you know, it's quite obstetric. It's very um, just giving a lot of detail about what can happen. It's like you're throwing the system into an ocean without a life raft. Whereas mm -hmm. the storytelling in spiritual midwifery is really mm -hmm. about showing how people have been able to get through birth, not just survive it, but to thrive as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So they're both informative, but very, very different narrative around, around mm -hmm. that. So, you know, information, which women get very overloaded with. Mm -hmm. Especially isn't always, nowadays. Yeah. Isn't always an mm -hmm. antidote to fear. It can um, be. You're right the right information that really gives a sense of context and understanding about how it's the how I often say it's the how people forget about mm -hmm. the how they talk about the mm -hmm. what what can happen but not enough about the how to deal with it and that's where storytelling can be very powerful mm. well I mean we could go on a tangent about being a storied being right yeah and right so there's yeah exactly yeah. And we also know that our our brain is constantly seeking out meaning. Yeah. And and and, and seeking chains. Yeah, well, and I we are, and I'm I'm working really hard to remove the word machine from all of that because yeah. we're more than a machine, right? Yeah. We are yeah. an organic organism that is a byproduct of our natural world. We are not separate from our natural world, yeah. right? And so we are a living being that is learning how to be human through yeah. story. Mm. And so you're right. Like one of the now I'm going to go on a tangent, so you can stop me. <laughs> so, so the the kind of information is what I'm hearing you speak to, right? Like yeah. how we gather that information. Yeah. So again, context, how we gather that context, right? Mm -hmm. So exploring, here's what I always say to people, um, because we are inundated with information online now in a way that 
um, is too much for our embodied system yeah. to even calculate and compute and digest. Exactly. Um, it throws our system into a state of alarm. Mm. And we don't know what to believe anymore. Mm. It's intended to confuse us, right? We are in such a confused, chaotic state collectively. And we um, have forgotten that there is a way to gather information that is a connected, slow form of communication. Mm. And so what I often speak about is how important it is and what I try to help moms return to is their sense of inner knowing. And that as you're sifting through information, it's like you're trying it on like a piece of clothing mm -hmm. to see how it fits. And I, and I say, it's, it's actually quite simple. Like our embodied system is so intelligent, right? If we were encouraged to listen to it, Yes. You know, we might feel more confident about it. Yes. Um, but we need to. We need to return to listening to it. And of course, mm. birth is all about listening to that as well, right? So um, and many of the moms I've worked with who have experienced traumatic or very disappointing birth experiences, they come back to this place of going, I didn't listen to that moment, but I know the moment. Yeah. Every single too. one of them right exactly so, yeah anyways again another tangent there but coming back to the tangent that's a that's a key <laughs> thing I, I yeah want to come in there i want to add to that because one of the things i really see so many women struggle with is making decisions towards the end of their pregnancy it's often related yeah. to induction it's often related to the safety of the baby which is always yeah. going to be at the foremost of our mind and I can feel the confusion in their system. I can see that they're, um, they've been strongly influenced by people who are doing their job, <clears throat> informing them of potential risks, um, trying to mitigate those risks by managing the process of birth, which then takes that woman on a completely different trajectory around welcoming the baby. I mean, induction mm -hmm. certainly does. And when I have had women in this state, I often get them to close their eyes, mm. breathe slowly, go back to the mm -hmm. calm breathing that I teach them. And I get them to imagine the two different paths and the options that they have and to walk on one path and then just to notice what your body tells you. Mm. And then hop off that path, now walk on the other path and notice what your body tells you. And without exception, doesn't matter what state that mother's in, that little exercise of just shutting mm -hmm. down the noise, shutting down the thinking and watching what how your body responds. None, No woman that I've ever done that with, and I've done it with many now because I was quite astounded by how clearly they were able to see and experience mm -hmm. that. They absolutely knew what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. More and more yeah. we're trying to gear women when it comes to choice making, not just for birth, but for new parenting as well, they get inundated with noise. Yeah. yeah. Tap into the system, their own system and the baby's mm -hmm. system. Yeah. Because you're in this beautiful dance with the baby and the baby's system is highly, highly intelligent. It's communicating to you 24 seven, but we can't read or attune to our babies when we've got a head full of stuff. And we've got yeah. people coming at us with advice and expertise and all of these mm -hmm. different things. So data points, right? Data so points. much yeah. data points. Absolutely. And we want to know yeah. the evidence. Well, yes, yeah, the evidence exactly. can be helpful, but it's only a very small part of the decision making puzzle. <clears throat> well, and the evidence is here. Absolutely. That's, right? The that's evidence much, is here. I would say that's a much more solid form of evidence what Jen, Jen had a hand on her heart when she mm -hmm. said that the evidence is within our system and within our bodies, but we're not taught to trust that. And no. I think that's actually not using one of the greatest resources you'll ever have in childbirth or the greatest mm -hmm. resource. The mother knows, her system knows. She doesn't know mm -hmm. she knows, but when people yeah. around her are attuned enough to, to ask her, she often has the answer of what needs to happen next. Mm -hmm. and, and even with that answer you know a mom can still come up against their fears or their limiting Absolutely. beliefs right and yeah, this is where 
Mm-hmm. And this is where doing that work or having a process such as the yeah. flowing fears process, for example, right, can really help you unhook from some of that. Yeah. And I have noticed like with some moms, you know, let, let's be honest, we live in a fear, we live in a, a death phobic culture, mm-hmm. right? We're afraid of death. Of course, yeah. And, you know, this shows up in the birth process in a very big way. Mm-hmm. It does. And we have forgotten that the initiation is that um, there is a risk. Mm. There is a risk. Yeah. And we need not be afraid of that risk. And that does not um, diminish the fact mm. that that can be very terrifying and real for people. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm not being floofy about this. No, I know. It's, right. It's the big one. Mm. It's the big one. Mm. But if we're willing to look at it, yeah. Honestly, with our embodied system and look at that fear straight on mm. and then make an internalized informed decision yeah. about the next step, right? Mm. And if we're willing to own the fact that maybe you're not comfortable making that decision. Yeah. Right? I have worked with moms where it's like I don't I don't want to do that work. I don't want to do the work of having to overcome that fear. And then it's like, you know what, then that's good information Mm. for you to make an empowered decision then about the kind of care you want for your labor and delivery. Yeah. And understanding the impact of that, Mm. right? It's liberating to know that it's not to say you're wrong. Yeah. For not maybe liberating yourself from the fear of death, let's say, you know, it's a big job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But the more honest we can be with ourselves, mm-hmm. the more real, the more willing we are to face it, you know, ahead of time, because mm-hmm. you will face it in labor. Yeah. 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 So I, I agree with you about mm-hmm. the data points and that. Um, so that there is that choice now, Jen. Yeah. Okay. So um, I said there's three factors. So I'll just name them context, connection, and choice. Right. So choice really has to do with um, having the freedom to make an informed decision, yeah. right? Along the way. And when I say freedom, I mean psychological freedom mm. as well as physical freedom, mm. right? We don't want to be held against our will. No. We know what happens to a trapped animal. Yeah. And we know what happens to a trapped human animal. And we certainly don't want women to be accepting procedures that they don't want. That's right. Mm-hmm. Or trapped in that experience, right? Which can happen and happen to my grandmother yeah. who was, you know, literally tied to a bed. Mm-hmm. And so um, choice mm-hmm. is an important factor to provide the nervous system with a sense of empowerment and calm, connected, right? Possibility, capacity, all that kind of stuff. So it's not in a state of alarm. And we know that we can't give birth when we're in a state of alarm or when we're in a sympathetic state, right? We don't we don't physiologically respond well to that, right? The body goes into protective mode instead of expansive mode. Mm, yeah. That's another story. So um, choice. So um, what that means is we don't want the illusion of choice, Mm -hmm. which many of us experience, Mm -hmm. right? The illusion of choice. Tokenistic choice. (laughs) That's right, right? We want to know. You have choice, but we're really going to encourage you down this path. Mm. Yeah. And we're going to infuse a lot of fear in that process, Mm. right? Yeah. So we think we're making a decision, but we're not making a decision. Mm. And that's going to be met with your system responding in a way that is alarmed. Mm. And then the third one is um, connection. And so if there's any risk of disconnection to our environment, to ourselves, to our loved ones, that also is going to alarm our nervous system, Mm. right? And so um, what I have noticed by talking to many moms is that all three of those um, uh, factors have been missing in a birth experience that didn't go the way that they had hoped it would go. Right. 
Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So coming I forget back, how to we, our... I forget how we got there. Yeah, help yeah, me. yeah. <laughs> coming back to our pregnant women, exploring mm -hmm. their fears, writing them down. Right. We're we're coming to the end of time now. What mm -hmm. what? Uh, two questions. What mm -hmm. can women do to really explore and to become more familiar with their system? And then how can they learn more about your work as well, Jen? I think it's certainly worth following up for those people who've been quite, mm. I certainly have been hooked on this conversation. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, so the first question was how can they get more familiar with yeah. that, with that system, process? With, with their... the fear, the fear, yeah. yeah. And, and with your process. I think your process sounds like it could be really helpful. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, like I said, that notice and name is really important. Um, and then questioning the stressful thoughts, really important. Gathering information, right? That's yeah. what we were talking about is really important. Yeah. Um, trying to gather that information and then uh, digesting it through your system, right? Sensing it through your system. Um, and so I was actually going to say one of the things I encourage people to pay attention to is when you hear that information do you constrict mm. do you resist it yeah or do you open to it and want more of it lean towards it mm. right and so that's an indicator yeah right is that information supportive mm. right our or bodies is are it... truth tellers exactly <laughs> <laughs> very much them. so yeah when we listen and we could have a whole conversation about <laughs> how we've been disconnected from listening, you know, <laughs> for a reason. Yeah. So, um, so that, so all of that's important, paying attention. Am I doing this? Am I doing this? When I'm, you know, online searching to understand something, right? Am I doing this or yeah. am I feeling more expansive? As you're listening to this conversation that we're having, right? Are you leaning in? Is it opening you up? Is it encouraging? Or are you turning away from it and doing this? Yeah. You know, that could be information that it's not the right conversation for you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so listening to those cues and then taking a risk by actually following through mm, and responding. Right? Exactly. To that if you're resisting, message. that's right. If you're resisting that information, mm. then let that go and keep kind of scanning until your system responds with a yes. Mm. That's how we a tune as you talk about, you know, the needle kind of thing, right? Yeah. We have, we have to do that work. It's not going to happen overnight mm. because so many of us have been disconnected from that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so important in labor and delivery that you've maybe honed in on that because then you can listen to it in labor and delivery, mm. Mm. right? When you're in the process, because ultimately you're so attuned and you're so attuned <laughs> Yeah. right that you know you just know what's best for you and your baby mm -hmm. and that could be asking for external help and that's fine yeah right but the more confidence you build ahead of time the more equipped you'll feel in that moment mm -hmm. and afterwards yeah. and that's a whole other conversation yeah in terms of like um more about this process so I've actually created a Flowing Fears audio course that walks you through the 10 steps, explains each step, and then ends with the guided process itself. Right. Now, sometimes that's enough for people. And of course, sometimes people need to be held through the process. Yeah. And it is a deep process, mm -hmm. but at least it's something. Yeah. Right. And um, so that's available on one of my websites. I can send you that information. Yeah, that would be wonderful. We'll keep we'll yeah. all of that information in the show notes. That's mm -hmm. terrific. What would you like to finish off with? Mm -hmm. What message would you give to women who are pregnant, who are exploring their minds, their systems, trying to, you know, connect in with that deeper intelligence that mm -hmm. we've been talking about? Mm -hmm. How would you like to finish off? I think that it's really important work. Mm. And that, you know, childbirth 
is a process of initiation. Mm. And that initiation means that you're going to go through an ordeal. Mm. And that ordeal is actually intended to um, mature you and develop you into the mother that you're supposed to be. Mm. And that you have the wisdom within your embodied system to not only know how to go through that ordeal that we call childbirth, but to know how to raise your child mm. and that the world needs you. Mm. Well said. <laughs> what a beautiful full stop. That's fantastic. <laughs> I've really appreciated this conversation because a lot of what Jennifer's talked about, I've been studying myself for many years as I've looked at how do we unlock our true potential? How do we unlock mm. some of those patterns, past traumas, past hurts? And it's led me down some really interesting um, paths, Joe Dispenza's work. Also, mm. um, I've been mm. a rapid transformational therapist through Marissa Peer's work. Mm. Which is, I've heard of that, um, yeah. Yeah, which has been incredible in watching some of the transformations that can happen. So there was a great deal in this episode. It may mm. not be for everybody. It's wherever you're at, we we try to meet you on the path of awakening because ultimately birth is the doorway to mm -hmm. parenting. It's the doorway to the bigger version of you. It may only be one or two days, but it does act as a catalyst to awaken lots of different forces inside of you. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly what the parenthood journey is all about. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And we'll have some more wonderful goodness for you next week. Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe and share this podcast. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. It is a place where you can learn, get support and grow into your role as a parent. Why not take advantage of a special gift for all pregnant women at transformyourbirth.com.au or if you have children, we have a gift for parents also.